The opinions expressed on the following audio program are solely those of the host and the guests. Burner Podcast is an independently produced, not-for-profit show and is not associated with the Burning Man organization or its subsidiaries. The views expressed are not representative of the entire Burning Man community and are presented here for entertainment purposes only. In short, calm the fuck down. It's just a podcast. All right, it's episode number 118, and it is 211 days till the man burns as of this recording. Recently, uh, the org conducted a survey to see how you folks feel about having a Black Rock City event, uh, a Burning Man event in 2021. I don't know the results or anything. Uh, This is a conversation that is, of course, the buzz of our community right now. Uh, Some of you may have seen Thunderdome's public statement as to why they will not be attending a Burning Man event in 2021 if it does move forward. Uh, it really, it was really impressive and it was really beautifully written, very moving. Um, we'll link over to it in the show notes if you've not ran across it yet. Uh, they have four primary concerns and they kind of break down all the details and safety is, of course, listed as their third, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> uh, they do clarify that even though it is listed as their third concern, it is actually their primary concern. Um, and uh, the the part that I personally resonated the most deeply with was um, this prediction of theirs that uh, should a Burning Man take place in the middle of this worldwide pandemic, which is affecting communities of color disproportionately, uh, it has the makings of inadvertently making Burning Man 2021 to be the least diverse one uh, in history. So um, I don't have any of the numbers or stats or anything, of course. Uh, it's definitely a very powerful statement to consider, one we'll, we'll chat about uh, today. Um, it moved me to review my own place in all of this. Uh, some some tough decisions have to be made moving forward. Uh, the burden of leadership is a thing. It's something I've been, I've been very interested in and very curious about uh, from a very young age. You know, the the decisions that we make, the the difficult decisions that we have to make that affect the communities outside of us as well as our closest circles, uh, business things, political things, all of this. Uh, it is a thing I predict we'll be talking about a lot in today's episode. Specifically, my guest is Rick Wilson. Rick's been burning for 15 years. He's the co-founder of Playa Q, uh, part of the Spanky's Village. Spanky's is one of those Black Rock City landmarks that literally, like, impossible to miss (laughs) if you ever go to Burning Man. I feel feel like it's, like, one spot you're always going to pass at some point. Uh, Rick's burn was in uh, the year 2000. And over the years, he's also camped with the Pickle Joint uh, out in the center ring and, of course, Spanky's. Um, and running alongside his Burning Man adventures, Rick uh, took the company for which he is the CEO, Miva Public. Uh, that, that's no, we're not actually public. Not public. Never mind. Nope. I will. I'm going to ask a lot of questions about that too. That's so fine. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, of course, I'm sitting here with Rick. Um, Rick's got. He's just a wealth of knowledge and and a very inspirational person. And I've been looking forward to having a conversation with him about uh, his rich history. And um, in the past couple of years, he's released a book and launched his own podcast. And I'm basically treating today's interview as like basically a masterclass uh, in leadership. Um, so awesome! I'm, I'm yeah. excited. I'm excited to hear what I have <laughs> to say. <laughs> I'm excited that I'm recording what you have to say. Uh, so I, I'm I'm super curious uh, to pick your brain uh, on lessons learned juggling our gifting economy with like Western capitalism. <laughs> yeah, that's a great topic. Yeah. And how they feed each other or bounce off of each other uh, if they do. Um, uh, they totally do. Excellent. Yeah. Good. Um, there is going to be a DJ set after today's show. I don't know what that DJ set is going to be yet. This is the part of the intro <laughs> that usually I'm like hyping up the DJ and like all excited about that. Our my, my producer Louis um, Adam Bermuda he he usually figures out this part of it for me, um, but just some things didn't line up and we didn't get the clearance fast enough. So here we're recording. There is going to be music after this conversation's over. Stay tuned. I promise you. I don't know yet what that's going to be. <laughs> Uh, maybe I don't know maybe I'll do a show editors note and pop in right here and say it but um, Louis working on that as we speak but let's go ahead and get into today's chat with Rick today's interview is entitled today's episode is entitled truckers on speed it is the perfect title. <laughs> uh, we literally were trying to decide what to name it, and it's it's a story that, that Rick is going to tell. So Truckers on Speed is the name of today's episode. I go by Mr. Arash, even though nobody calls me Mr. Welcome to Burner Podcast. On the first part of the journey, I was 
start with that story. You want to start a, with that story? Yeah, totally. Sure. So, um, as you said in the intro, I started going to Burning Man in 2000. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and so I kind of count myself as a 22-year burner, even though, or whatever you'd want to count it, but but I've been 15 times. Okay. And so, uh, I went in 2001 and 02. I had to skip 03 for a wedding. But, frankly, 2000 was life-changing in many ways, but frankly, I didn't really get Burning Man my first year. Hmm. Um I thought I was going to a big party in the desert, and certainly that's that's an aspect of it. Yeah. But um, but I uh, I sort of left with this with with conflicting experience. One of them was, you know, if I'm just looking for a big party, there are more comfortable places to have a big party. Absolutely. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> much much more much, much more comfortable <laughs> places to have a big party. <laughs> and if um, but at the same point, the con- the conflict in that experience was. Everywhere I looked, people were having what I would call transformational experiences, mm. right? Um, my friends, strangers, all of the amazing things that happen, the playa magic that happens. And so I sort of felt like I was missing that transformational experience. And so I made a commitment to keep going back to Burning Man until I figured it out. Okay. So I go back in 01. Can you give an example of one transformational spe- experience that like caught your attention that made you think that that's something that you were not receiving? Well, yeah. I mean, I think, I think I, it was nothing external. It was entirely internal. And I think, uh, you know, I, I've been a big guy my whole life. Uh, and back then I was much bigger. I was more overweight. Here, here was an example that always comes back to me from 2000. I remember seeing, you know, overweight, naked people walking around and having this mental experience of like, of like, I think I was too ashamed to do that. Right. And so, right. so I wasn't having the transformational experience. I didn't have the body positivity breakthrough in 2000. Mm-hmm. It took a little while. Yeah. Right. But I could see it. I could see that they had it. Right. Like, yeah, like yeah. that person right there walking along had it and I hadn't had it. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also, that's in and of itself its own circular thing. Right. I'm trying to own something that you can't own and there's so much there. But, uh, but I did commit to continuing to go back to Burning Man and like pulling on the threads until I, until I found my place, if you will. Mm-hmm. So I go back in 01 and uh, like many sophomores, I, uh, art cars were a little different back then. Uh, you, know, you didn't have to get them pre-approved or anything. But I tried building an art car, total disaster. Yeah. Uh, I brought an electric golf cart. I didn't have the proper generator to charge it. I think I got to drive it all about one and a half miles. I went to the DMV, from the DMV to the man. It died on the way to the man. I pushed it back to camp, and that was the end of the golf cart. Um, and, and so then in 02, I went back with a good friend of mine. Uh, some people listening to the podcast might even have known him when he was alive, Sauce Boss. Mm. Um, and Sauce, that was his first year. And the Sauce Boss and I and our, our friend Dave, who, who play name was Fresh, or is Fresh, um, we, uh, we, did a, we, we were part of a uh, subcamp of Illumination Village uh, with Rebecca Hot Metal from the Flaming Lotus Girls. And, um, and we had a kitchen. It was a really early communal kitchen for Burning Man. And... Um, and before, the first two years, I had basically lived on like peanut butter sandwiches and granola bars, um, and it, that was actually the beginning of me having new experiences in the playa. In some ways, in that I didn't feel like I was constantly on the edge of dying, and um, and there was this idea that you know what you put in your body is going to change how you can experience and relate to the playa. Like I said, I took O three off, but um, in O three, Sauce Boss went back without me. Uh, and started a barbecue, like a huge gourmet barbecue called the Playa Q. But that year was just, you know, he had a big grill. He had made, taken some some um, some big metal containers and just made this cool Mad Max looking barbecue. Mm-hmm. And we started plotting and scheming. So in 2004, back back then Spanky's was called the Glom. 
um, maybe original founding members of the Glom might say it wasn't really Spankies, but same same group of people for the most part, same thing. Yeah. And um, and we were a sub camp of the Glom in 2004, and we ran a barbecue restaurant. So we set up a 4,000 square foot restaurant under a circus tent, focused on. Uh, performance art food, where we would try to stimulate all five senses. So we'd have DJs, we'd have masseuses, we'd have obviously the smell of barbecue, we'd have the taste of the food. We would serve these elaborate, insane seventeen course meals. Um, we would, seventeen you know, course. Sometimes that was the biggest, yeah. And so I'm trying um, to think like what the fifth course would be. <laughs> Much uh, less seventeen. Milk soaked alligator. Milk soaked alligator. Yep. <laughs> and wow. And I'm gonna for show notes. I'm gonna see if I, I have a. I have, and other people in the Burning Man community have. There's not a ton of, well, I have a, yeah, a black, or not a black, a silver, like, stainless steel menu that looks like the size of a license plate that's got all the courses on that's it. That's insane. <laughs> so, uh, so, so f- to try to get to the truckers on speed, in 2005, we had um, sort of, the glom, the glom, this is when the glom was sort of dispar, dis, uh, Dissipating, mm. and about, and then and then eventually eventually sort of relaunched as Spanky's a couple years later, right? And um and so we took over sort of the shell of what was left of the Glom, and and the Playa Q became its own uh, Esplanade theme camp, mm. and that was a big project. I mean, especially in two thousand five, um, you know. These days, there's you know plug and play talks and controversies and all that stuff. None of that existed then. Right. You know, you would have to. There was no um, managed services. You couldn't have stuff delivered on the playa. You'd have to go meet people at the gate with a ticket. Uh, there was no cell service to, of any. There wasn't even cell service in Gerlach back right. then. There was really nothing past Pyramid Lake. Can you, so you, you briefly touched on that. I'm sorry for just listeners oh, who are not familiar with management services. Manage- oh, sure. So, so management services allows large scale camps to happen. Mm. So it started, I, I forgive my history if it's slightly wrong, but sure. I believe it started with being able to get diesel to the camps that needed diesel and right. propane. Right. So it's just started with, I need diesel and propane to run these big fire camps. Right. Yeah. And, and then it went on to things like we could get charcoal delivered and you could get fresh vegetables delivered and you could get yeah. f- like f- perishable food things delivered. And there were certain things that Burning Man, these, these vendors would, would coordinate with Burning Man and get on the list and then you could have an order delivered to you. But that didn't, I think that began in its infancy in 06. Right, right, right. And in, you know, this isn't my story or, or, the, or what we're talking about today on the podcast, but sure. that ultimately led to people started abusing a lot of that, which is what led to plug and play camps, right? Because right? you could get stuff like a motorhome delivered, right? right? 2005, there's none of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So in 2005, uh, we went up to Idaho, to Boise, to stage for the playa. And so we bought all of our food from food distributors up there. We brought 3,000 pounds of meat to the playa in 2005. Wow. How and, many people uh, on your camp at that time? There was, gosh, I want to say we had 250 people that year. Okay. So it was, it was probably our peak, peak size yeah, as far yeah. as bodies go. And um, so Alex, Sauce Boss, Alex and I were in... We're in Boise prepping. Uh, we also had Travis, who's known as Smooth, and and a few other people, a uh, bunch of people. Big, huge shout out to the Boise Burner community. They're awesome. Yeah. They're really, uh, really like family up there. Uh, Doctor Naked, a m- bunch of others, just great guys and gals and people. Yeah. Um, and so we were up there for five weeks preparing, buying food, buying refrigerators, buying deep freezers, buying all this stuff, and. You know, it, it didn't take long to figure out. We didn't know how we were going to move all this stuff to the playa, yeah. right? We were we had set up in Boise for access to stuff, and that it was re- it was much closer to the playa for us than say San Diego, where I live. Um, but but we had to figure this out, and so one of the people we knew who has since passed away was named Mayor Joey, and he was one of the founders of the Glom. He was longtime burner from from the '90s and early mm-hmm. 2000s, and he had a I think a 25 acre or 50 acre ranch in Fallon, right? Yeah. And so we would pop in and out of Mayor Joey's and use it as a staging ground. And so we go to Mayor Joey and say, hey, how do we, um, how do we get all this stuff to the playa? Hmm. And he had some local truckers that he <laughs> referred to us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so, so a couple good old boys from Fallon. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, they, uh, we had met them at Mayor Joey's and, you know, look, I mean, you get used to, you get used to, um, you know, you know, especially back in 2005, Fallon hadn't, Fallon's really grown up. I mean, Mm. Fallon's now a big UPS distribution center and Top Gun is there for the military. So Fallon's a different town now than it was then. Fallon's almost a, a, you know, just slightly smaller than Carson City at this point. Back then, 
Fallon wasn't. Fallon was really rural, small town. And, um, and so we meet these guys and, you know, the guys with, with us, with a flatbed semi. So it's like, okay, we'll do it. So, um, these aren't burners. These are just some, some they had, guys. one of the two had been to Burning Man, but okay. he, I, I'm going to sound burnier than thou, but he, <laughs> he wasn't a burner <laughs> yeah. in my estimation. He was a guy who lived in Fallon who would get free tickets and go to the right. playa. But I think he was often doing this kind of stuff. He was transporting stuff and helping. So, you know, he's a helpful guy. His gotcha. name was Pat. He was great. Pat was not the one on speed per se. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, uh, we're now in Boise, and it, and you know and anyone who's ever prepped for a camp or even just prepped to get themselves to Burning Man, you know what a somewhat Herculean effort it is. And uh, so we're there, and you know we've been up, we've been up off and on. You know our sleep patterns at this point were messed, right? You know we're doing two hours here, or three hours there, trying to get everything ready to to get out. And we're going out. Back then, early arrival wasn't what it is today. So back then we early arrived on the Thursday before gate opening, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. And that was real early back then. And um so we arrive and you know, other than DPW, we're probably one of the first hundred or two hundred people on the playa. And uh and so be- right before arrival, we're in Boise, we're getting ready to pack up and they show up with the truck and the the main guy, the guy whose truck it was, has um a but he's got one of those big butane torch things with him. <laughs> and he is, and I don't know his name, so I won't, I won't even be able yeah. to share it to protect the guilty. But he is, he is smoking a lot of crystal meth as he's helping us load. Okay, this and, is like in a pipe. Uh, yeah, and like a like a little crack pipe. pipe, a little crack. Yeah, okay, yeah, a little glass crack pipe. And so he and Alex and oh I are, God. Alex and I are looking at each other, and you know, you're running through your options. Now, first of all, here we are. We're in our early 30s. We're broke. Yeah, we are. You know, our camp's got about a fifty thousand dollar budget, almost entirely of donations and dues. And we don't have any margin for error. I can't just yeah. go call a trucking company, right? Like, I don't have a backup. My my backup was, this was my first up and my backup and all my ups. So Alex and I are watching this guy, and we're, like, side-eyeing each other. Like, what the fuck are we going to do here? And, uh, we, you know, we powwow a bunch, and, you know, and we're already exhausted just preparing for the playa. Mm. So we work with them to get everything loaded. And next thing you know, we have, you know, we have a ton I mean, he's, of, he's, literally he's, just 3,000 pounds of meat, not counting... All of our other gear. Yeah. Is he is he providing good labor? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. Why, that's I mean, look, he's, he, the guy was he was a big guy. He was like a yeah. force of nature as far yeah. as that goes. So he's just like lifting stuff and then stops and smokes some crystal meth and then gets back to doing what he's doing. Yeah. So what would actually <laughs> it's funny you describe it like that and it's not that far off. He would he would work really hard yeah. for maybe thirty minutes. Yeah. And then he would excuse himself to the cab of his truck, <laughs> and then he'd come back and do another rush of work. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it's, I don't remember if it was always 30 minutes, you know, it might have been right. an hour or an hour and a half, but there was, there was routine breaks there. He would disappear in the camera truck and then, you know, yeah, you'd like see a cigarette the, break. <laughs> yeah. You'd see the butane fire up. And so we get everything loaded yeah. and they leave before us, right? So he's got this flatbed semi and all of our gear, everything, yeah. right? And there's, there's definitely worry on our part. Like what on earth is about yeah. to happen? So they leave before us and, um, and we we sleep because we're like we have to sleep, and then we'll go to the playa in the morning. So I think I want to say that you leave at eleven p.m. Yeah. We get up at like six a.m. I imagine because you haven't been smoking crystal meth all day. Correct. I haven't been smoking crystal meth, so I'm <laughs> totally belts. capable of sleeping. Yeah. And uh, yeah. and so I sleep, and I'm like living out of a cargo van that I built a little room in the back of a cargo van. Right. That's that's my makeshift RV for the playa that year. And um, and so I uh, we go to sleep at like eleven, sleep till like six a.m., get up. Head to the playa. So I want to say we got on playa like 2 p.m. Mm. And there's no truckers. There's no truck. There's no truckers. So now we have nothing. Like we have no shade. We have no gear. We have a we have like three coolers oh and our God. clothes and a plot of pl- Esplanade front land on the playa (laughs) and nothing right and there's no other camps there's no place to go even the closest thing to getting shade is we could drive our cargo van over to center camp and like hide from the sun for a little bit but it was brutal Mm. and again there's no cell phone service there's not even a gerlach so you to make a phone call you had to drive to gerlach and use the payphone and the payphone at I think it's a Texco. The payphone at that Texco and Gerlach. Oh my god, that sounds lovely though. Would re- it was there was there was something magical about <laughs> yeah. it. But that payphone, uh, I think even usually before the event started, would max with coins, and you'd stop being able to use it. You'd have to use a calling card to make a phone call. That is amazing, right? I mean, if 
for those of you who are old enough to remember what a calling card is. And yeah. so, so, um, so I'm our international audience understands. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm there, I'm sort of in charge running back and forth to the Texaco from the playa to try to find our truckers. And I'm calling Mayor Joey, the intermediate. Yeah. And he's like, don't worry, don't worry. They'll be there. It turns out they had broken an axle on the trailer, uh, near Winnemucca. They had stopped to fix the axle. They'd probably had to get some sleep at some point. No matter how much crystal meth you yeah. sleep, you still need some sl- <laughs> yeah. smoke. You still need some sleep. And um, and so finally about midnight that night, they come rolling in. I'm waiting at the gate. Just like I have nothing to do but wait at the gate because we don't have anything. That we is have clothes yeah. and, no, and no food. Yeah. Barely any water to survive. You know, thank God for the playa and the friendly people on the playa. Yeah. So... Um, but there just wasn't much. I mean, DPW's out there and a couple hundred people set in doing early setup, right? right? And so so finally about midnight that night, they come rolling into the gate. And I just remember like, oh, my God, thank God. <laughs> so um, so then, you know, so then we successfully run our camp. We have a banner camp. And uh, for, for old school burners, that was the year that Dickie was in the clear box. So Dickie was in the box. And, um, and long before Dick in a Box became a song. And uh, so Dickie was in the box <laughs> as an art project. Mm. And, um, and then Monday comes. and Dickie's, uh, I'm sorry, clarify. There was a guy named Dickie. A person named Dickie. Yeah, and he built a clear box, uh-huh. just a clear like uh, acrylic box on, on Open Playa. It wasn't far from our camp, so it was probably at like 4 p.m. in Esplanade, just like out a little bit, uh-huh. kind of near where Thunderdome normally is. Okay. And, um, and he was in a clear box, and you could go interact with him. Like I can't remember if you could talk to him or you had to pass notes, huh. but he was in a clear box the whole event. Like in the heat? In yep. the Wow. Yeah, and I don't remember. Like I think he had some curtain or something going to the bathroom, but I don't really recall the that details. That was going to be immediately my next question. Yeah, uh-huh. I, I do. Rec- I, there was a method for him going to the bathroom, but I don't recall if he had any privacy. Um, I don't recall. He had some provisions in there for food. I think you could hand. I think you could. I think there was like a like like an acrylic vault that you could put shit through. Wow. To give okay. to him. So yeah. Dicky was in there for the week, and he was actually like a. It was one of the at least for me and my being my fourth burn or fifth burn. It was one of the first significant performance art yeah. projects I had seen like that. That's you know, some avant garde shit right there. Yeah, you'd seen some really yeah. wild stuff, and that was wild. And Dicky was definitely the talk of the playa that year. Yeah, that was all the also the year La Contessa tried to drive to Gerlach and and got stuck on the way out and and screwed up La Contessa, but that's a different story. <laughs> so um so here we are, uh, the event's over, um, Temple Burn Sunday night, Monday people are exodusing, uh, and we knew we weren't leaving Monday. Mm-hmm. We were supposed to leave Tuesday afternoon. Are, are the I'm sorry, are the truckers did they stay or you said they left? Uh, Pat, the the one who the non speed trucker, right. had stayed, but he hadn't stayed with the truck. He had just gotcha. gone back, grabbed his like truck, his regular like pickup truck, okay, and come back out. So Pat was around off and on all week, but he didn't live that far, so he would kind of come and go from the playa, right? Um, and so I want to say it was Sunday or something. Pat leaves, and okay, we'll see you Tuesday. And um, so Tuesday comes and Tuesday night. Sunset's happening Tuesday. There's no one. I'm back mm-hmm. to trying to run to Gerlach to make phone calls. I can't get a hold of anybody. Oh my God. Um, DPW is left out there. D- we end up throwing a party for DPW and Dicky from Dicky in the Box. Did he come out of the box? He did. He okay. was out of the box. Now <laughs> the event was over. He was out of the box. So we're having this like bar- final final cue, yeah. and we're giving away barbecue. And the tr- but I'm panicking. Because it's my job to get us off the playa, right? If Alex was the head chef and sort of performance artist, yeah. I was the logistician. I was the, for lack of a better term, the CEO of the playa queue. So I'm panicking. I can't find these truckers. And I don't want to have to drive all the way to Fallon, which Fallon's not that far for compared to most people's journey to the playa. Right. But a 200-mile round trip plus getting on and off playa plus, 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 Fallon's not minor, right? And yeah. so... um. So I'm trying to get a hold of Pat and the truckers, and I can't get a hold of anybody. I can't get a hold of anybody. I can't get a hold of anybody. So now it's Wednesday, and pretty much the only people on Playa are the te- are, are like Resto, and what's left of DPW and Resto oh my and gosh. us, and um, and then BLM starts coming by. And the BLM <laughs> starts coming by and threatening to ticket us, th- you know, threatening all sorts of stuff, but mostly tickets. Like, hey, yeah. you don't have the right to be here anymore. You got to leave. And I remember I, I wasn't bluffing. I just had to tell the BLM, I can't get, you want me to leave all of this gear here? Yeah. I mean, this is a leave no trace event. You want me to leave, you know, 
eight freezers and fridges and all this food and all and a circus tent and Look a kitchen. That. You were the original 747. <laughs> yeah. I'm dying. Well, hopefully there was someone before us. But yeah, we were like the 747 yeah. in that sense. So the BLM's bugging me and I'm running back and forth. And we can't get them. We just can't find them. Right. And we cannot find our truckers on speed. Well, it turns out the other guy, the actual trucker on speed, had you know maintained his sort of bender and just crashed. Like he could not. So apparently he had slept for like four days. Yeah. And um, but we had no. We had no. We weren't getting. There was all, not only was there the was his behavior frustrating, to say the least. That's but. Diplomatic. That's diplomatic. <laughs> and then there was no communication methods, right? So not right. like today where you could call someone from a cell phone or text someone. There was sure. really communication was strained and difficult. Um, but even Pat, the the intermediary, couldn't get a hold of the guy with the truck. So there was no there was no final mile to the guy with the truck. And we're just sitting out there and the BLM's harassing me. I remember one time I had to run into Gerlach to the Texco to try to make a phone call. And I'm in my white cargo van. And you know, at this point, I'm fried, yeah. and I'm flying back to the playa, and I'm speeding on that little stretch of highway where you're not supposed to go over 55, and I get pulled over by a BLM guy, and it was the same BLM guy who had been <laughs> pissed at me, and he walks up, and right as he gets to eyesight of me, he goes, it's fucking you, <laughs> and he just turned and walked away. <laughs> like he was feeling your pain. He was just, yeah. and he was pissed at me, but yeah. he knew he was stuck with me, <laughs> and so... So yeah, so we go back to I go back to camp and you know God God willing and thank God on th- I don't think the trucker on speed ever came back. Pat got someone else. Pat came through for us yeah. and got someone else to show up and load us out. Oh, so wow. that was my trucker on P- speed oh, story from 2005. That is well, number one. I apologize for the misleading title because we did say truckers on truckers, speed. Yeah, it was but well. It's I, only like I don't want to. Pat was such a good guy, and I, I can't say for sure he didn't do any speed. But so we can't say he didn't do speed. I can't say he didn't. I can't. I can't. I, I also can't really say he did. I don't know. We can neither <laughs> confirm nor deny that uh, you yeah. and I are on speed, even as we speak. That's true. We, I, mean, <laughs> I am on coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, got, okay, there's so everything you're telling in that story, Rick, is bringing up topics that i'd made notes about that i okay. wanted to ask because like there's a few of them um because i'm thinking about like this was 2004 this whole five thing that, this is that, five. that was five that was our second year running the okay. restaurant and 2000 was your first one yep like one of the things that i've noted here uh and, and it's interesting because like as i do this podcast it's always like very interwoven with like my own journey what's happening sure and one of the interesting things that i've been exploring um uh, in the past week is uh this phrase um, I'd like to make friends with fear and stress. And everything you're describing sounds so <laughs> fucking stressful. Like, it, w- it was. <laughs> it was like like the amount of responsibility. And I'm like, I'm hearing all this and I'm just like, I'm crumbling on the inside imagining myself in that situation. But but somehow, like I imagine, like this is a part of what you've developed over the years in your own like leadership style and, and you know, having employees and, and running companies and, and being in leadership situations. Like I'm hearing all of this and I'm like, this is, this is a part of what goes into it. You know, like hundred percent being friends with stress. <laughs> well, so, so yes, yes. And as they say in improv and other things, yeah. um, you know, going back to how the gifting economy ties into Western style business and capitalism, mm-hmm. um, you know, Alex was always the traditional performance artist, right? So Alex, we would, you know, we did playa cues at a lot of regionals, and we did it on the playa for many years. And and the, you know, you, when you when you get some great food on the playa, there's almost nothing better. But oh yeah, yeah. But but Alex was what I would call the more traditional artist, and I was I'm an artistic minded person, but I never had a medium, so to speak, right? Mm. And I remember one of the things that fascinated me about early playa was here you are, and you get all these people for the most part to volunteer. Um, we certainly didn't have anyone paid, sure. you know, and most people were paying us money and volunteering. So how do you get people to volunteer and choose to do that with your camp? Right. Like right. you don't have, Hey, Hey Minnie, you don't have the, um, you don't have what most people might consider the traditional levers in a work, work relationship or capitalist okay. work relationship. Levers? Levers as in like, if you don't go to work, you're going to get fired. Right. 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 Someone on the playa doesn't show up for a volunteer shift. What are you going to do? Right. Right. You don't have any, you don't have any recourse. You can, 
you can be mad. Yeah. Right. Maybe. Right. Or you can accept that things happen on the playa and you can roll with it. That's that's one of those early experience. I think there's like a list of early experiences at some point. I'd like to like bullet point things you experience your first printing man, like the world not falling apart when you left. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah. You're not that yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. And, I'm yeah. Not, and that's not a disc. Is this true yeah. for all of us? It's liberating. <laughs> yeah. It's totally liberating. When Larry but, uh, Harvey was alive, he wasn't that important anymore. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 <laughs> he did his work in the early 90s and the machine kept going. Totally. Totally. <laughs> yeah. No, and just what you're describing, like that, that sense of like, I remember my first burn, I was co-lead on San Diego's regional project. And a lot of my stress was like, what do I do if people don't show up? And people would just shrug. I'm like, I don't understand how what's happening yeah. here. <laughs> no, so that was actually, so it's great that you're keyed in on that because that was one of the things that drew me to wanting to run this camp. And this right. goes back to what I originally opened with, which is I wanted to get it. I uh, wanted to get Burning Man. Yeah. And what one of the ways that that worked for me, and everyone has their own journey, but one of the ways that worked for me was I remember thinking if I could run a camp that was filled with happy people who were having transformational experiences and volunteering to do it on, like people were volunteering to do kitchen duty yeah and they would come out and hug you and be like this was the greatest experience of my life that was the sauce like right. that was the secret sauce and it those i mean i was already you know i was a young executive at that point but that those experiences significantly shaped and molded my leadership style as right. an owner and when i ultimately became ceo of my own company those things were significant i never wanted to have the mindset that you're here because I'm paying you. Now, yeah, of course, yeah. you know, that's part of working for a living in, in, in the default world. You get a paycheck. But the fact of the matter is we can get paychecks anywhere. Right. Right. I want to add in all that extra secret sauce on top of the paycheck. That's why people, I want people on my team and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. That's not so powerful because it's, it's, I don't want to make this sound like it's a black and white statement. Um, but it's something that's, I've thought about quite a bit. Uh, it, if you have to pay somebody to be there and the only reason they're there is because of the money, you're a manager. But if they're there because you're inspiring them to better themselves and as a in part of that trade off and part of that dance is everyone is winning, that's leadership. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so so that was really, if you will, my art project on the playa. Mm. And then um, you know, and then that that's sort of uh, you know, I, I after 05, 05 was my not my last year running the Playa Cube, but it was my last year in that phase. Right. And then I switched to the pickle joint, which even though I've always been sort of a part of Spanky's, an honorary part of Spanky's, mm. uh, I've camped at the pickle joint actually more than any other camp. So the pickle joint's in center camp ring, usually next to Arctica. Okay. Um, what took you there? Well, it was a bunch of my friends had founded it. So a number of my close friends from Los Angeles had founded it, and that group spread out. So it was people from L.A. and New York and in San Francisco and, and ultimately everywhere in the country. Um, but it was this great intimate little camp, usually between 10 and 20 people. And we have, we have an old um, Korea war era mess hall tent, but it's tiny. And mm -hmm. we would set up this, it looks like a boudoir comes out of mash yeah. and we serve pickle teenies. And it's just like, and we have the, the best parties and it's just fun. And, um, and, and it's just, just the right amount of snark, but playa magic and great pickle teenies. And, yeah. and so I started camping with the pickle joint in 06. I got my, I bought my company that I'm now CEO of in 07. So I skipped 07 and 08 and then pickle joint, uh, 9, 10 through 16, because I just kept going and going and going. Um, and, but then in 2016, and then in 2016, my partner in the Playa Q, Alex Sauce Boss, passed away. Mm -hmm. And um, and for me personally, 16 was a really, 16 was, you know, I had, I had been, I guess, blessed, if you want to say that. Before 2016, I hadn't had much death in my life. Mm. And 2016 was a year where there was just a lot of death. My father passed that year. My cousin passed. My aunt passed. And like, 10 friends, right? So, and Sauce Boss being one of them. And so in part of the grieving process, um, you know, and I, we talk about co-founding a camp or running a camp, you know, that's true in a sense in that I was on the, you know, Alex and I were on telephone calls with Adam deciding, you know, what we were going to do. But, but really there's a crew, there's always a crew and there's right. a group of people who make it happen. So I called the band, if you will, and mm -hmm. said, let's run, let's run, let's get it all back together. Let's 2017, Let's do what we called Final Q. And, um, and that was part of Spanky's. So it was a sub camp of Spanky's that year. I didn't, I didn't have the wherewithal to go put an infrastructure together and get big generators and all that yeah. stuff. And so we did a Final Q that was honoring Sauce Boss. That was the point of it. 
But that year, we also got to do something else that I thought was a really special experience on the Playa. We did uh, the Playa Q evolved to do this thing called the Carne Armada. So we would the Carne Armada. Carne Armada. Okay. And um, so, like Carne Asada, obviously. Like I was but, about to say, like Carne Asada. Yes. <laughs> okay, got it. But an armada, <laughs> like an armada of of art art cars. Yeah. And so we would recruit. I, I don't remember how many we had in seventeen. I want to say we had five or six. And um, we and we coordinated with Maid Marian, yeah. and we. Uh, and the whole thing about the Carne Armada is you attack a camp. And and the idea was, the original idea for this that Alex and I concocted back in like 04, 05, was these artists are out there killing themselves. Yeah. And no one's taking care of them. So the early incarnation of the Carne Armada was that we would go feed artists. Hmm. And then actually, um, there's a well-known camp called Feed the Artists that exists now that was actually an offshoot of the Carne Armada. So oh. Colonel Angus, who runs Feed the Artists, was a member of the Playa Q. And then he spun off and created like a more formal, sort of less, I wouldn't say it's less artistic, just different. He runs, he runs it like a very well machine. Yeah. We were a little bit more pirate style. <laughs> but, um, but we would have a group of art cars and we would have dancer, go-go dancers and masseuses and fire spinners and a DJ and all the food. Yeah. And we'd have one inside person at the camp and we would roll into the camp and attack and put on a party for 90 minutes and then disappear. <laughs> and um, and we, you know, <laughs> one of the ideas was camping in center camp ring all the time. I was down from first camp for years. Mm. And, you know, first camp's important in that it's the seat of Burning Man, but there wasn't, there's not much going on at first camp. Right. right? Yeah. It's, a quiet, it's a quiet little corner of the playa. And so we had this idea that we wanted to turn, we wanted to turn first camp up <laughs> and in honor of Alex. And so, uh, so we, we back channeled to Maid Marian and she was our inside person and she told us when everyone was going to be there Yeah, and we rolled up with the art cars. And I remember <laughs> if Will Roger happens to listen to this and I don't know <laughs> Will other than this one experience, we come flying up <laughs> and I'm the first one off the art cars and Will comes right to where the art cars are. He's like, you can't be here. You can't be here. And I'm like, no, we're here for the barbecue thing. He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> they let us guard down and let us in. And we threw what had to be the best party first camp scene in 20 years. Wow. Um, serving food and dancers and just really like letting the people who put the event on relax and get served for once, which right. I think it's servant leadership. That's, that's the other part of this whole leadership story, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Take care of those taking care of you. Yeah, yeah. It, servant leadership, uh, I mean, it, it is... It, again, this is something I've been exploring for a long time. Um, you know, at, at, again, like taking sort of being in a power position is again like being a boss. Um, but leadership usually is a, the, the most powerful leaders are the ones that really do see it as, as a service. This is something Absolutely. that I happen to be good at that I can do, um, and it helps so that you can focus on the various you know moving parts of this machinery so that we can all kind of elevate together. Yeah, and you know, for me. I've had my own personal journey around that subject, as I would assume almost any leader does. Sure. And um, when I was younger, I was certainly motivated to be successful, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be that thing. And and probably in many ways, Maslow hierarchy of needs stuff, right? And you know, trying to get from survival to stability to success to significance. And um, but I know for me, and I've talked to a lot of other people. There's a point when you reach some success, whatever that definition is. It doesn't have to doesn't have to necessarily be money or anything else. But there's a point where you reach some success, where the thing that was driving you to get to that stage, at least for me, was no longer driving. Mm. Right? Like there was a point that I wasn't worried about how I was going to put food on the table. There was I wasn't worried about, you know, making my mortgage kind of thing. And and my motivation to get up every day and and quote unquote hustle just to put another dollar in the bank or whatever was really diminishing. It wasn't rewarding. Right. And it was, and it was in those reflective moments that servant leadership was a thing. How do I build a culture? How do I, so, so switching from burning man, but this all ties to what I said about the play queue. Yeah. How do I, how do I make my employees lives better? It's not just about paying them a decent salary. It's, you know, before pandemic, most people spent more time at the office with their coworkers than they did with their own family, right? That was just the nature of office work. So why would you want to spend time at a place you hate, right? Why shouldn't this be a place of joy? Why shouldn't I be there to serve those people and make their lives better? Yeah. And, and I definitely, those things were reflections that came without a doubt firsthand from what I learned from running a camp and my experiences running a camp and from Burning Man in general. The entire culture of Burning Man, I think, exudes that. Right, right, right. Because, well, that, that's a good transition then because I want to know, 
where you kind of got started. Where did you grow up and, and how was there, do you remember like an earliest time in your life where the idea of leadership became something that you were paying attention to. <laughs> yeah, I do. I have another stupid story for you. Well, we got um, time for lots of stupid stories. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I grew up in Orange County, California. Okay. So I grew up in a little town called Fountain Valley, which is right between Costa Mesa and Huntington Beach. Yeah, and, they have like uh, 23 cities in Orange County. <laughs> yeah, there is, yeah. <laughs> and so um, so I always say I grew up s- six miles from the beach, just, past, just inside of Huntington Beach. Yeah. Um, halfway between... Huntington Beach at Brookhurst and Disneyland. Um, so I grew up. I grew up there, uh, coming of age, so to speak, in the '80s. Graduated high school in '90. Mm. And uh, what kind of parents did you have? My dad was an entrepreneur. Okay. He. Uh, they were married. They were married until the day my dad passed. Mm. Um, so they were together. They were together a total of 50 years, and they were married for 48. Wow. And um, and so I had great parents. I really did have great parents. My dad had grown up poor in Oklahoma. He was born in the first year of the Great Depression in a barn in Oklahoma. Wow. And he wanted to make something of himself. So he went on to um, he went on to start a wood a woodworking business of sorts in Southern California. And so by the time I came on the scene that existed. And uh, and so my dad was an entrepreneur, had about fifty employees and and he built cabinetry, display cabinetry for high end stores, Disneyland, SeaWorld, jewelry stores, blah blah blah. Okay. You know, back in the eighties, if you were at South Coast Plaza and you were buying something out of a display cabinetry, it was almost certainly from my dad. Mm. Um, not, the, not the goods, just the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's, that's how I grew up, and, um, and I, was in, I got involved in leadership at school. So the, the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm how big was your dad's company? 50 people. 50, okay. So but I mean, st- it wasn't, it wasn't uh, 50 people today in a tech company can be big. 50 people m- m- doing woodwork, it was, it was a small business. Right, a small business, yeah. But like there's, there's some, you were watching somebody early in your life being in charge of a bunch of people's lives. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and at some level, I didn't know any other way. Right. I don't, I don't know how good of an employee I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I get it. <laughs> I think I'm a great, I, I do think I'm a great leader, yeah. but I don't know how good of an employee I am. Yeah. And so I'm okay. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm competent and I can get stuff done, but, <laughs> but, I, <laughs> but I like being in the leadership roles. Yeah. You said you got involved in leadership at school? What's that? You said you got involved in leadership at school? I got involved in leadership at school, yeah. and then I, when I was young, I can't believe I'm about to say this out loud, although anyone who's known me has heard this yeah. silly story. I thought I was going to be president someday. That's fair. And so um, my senior year in high school, in my yearbook, you know, you Listen, got to nothing write... shocks me about this reality anymore. <laughs> very well, well still might happen. Y- well, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, you see up, who until the last 20, guy was? up until 2016, <laughs> I thought that was a stupid fantasy. Now, yeah. <laughs> also, I've also matured enough to know I don't want that job. Yeah, yeah. But, that I agree with. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so I, right, you know, back then you could. Right. One of the ways the, the yearbook would fund itself was you could pay for a little spot and you could write a note, write a letter. Mm. So I had this handwritten note in my yearbook about, and it was <laughs> so stupid. It was almost a letter to the haters because I was this overweight, awkward kid, yeah. and I'd been picked on a lot. And it was basically like, "Fuck all y'all. Watch me when I'm president." <laughs> 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 oh my gosh! Yeah, and so um, I and mean, then, most of us fat kids just you know like get funny. Yeah, well, and <laughs> you're like, I'm going to be president. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I once I gave up on pres on, on trying to be president, I did go to Second City to learn improv. So I tried to get some humor in there. <laughs> Good, uh, but um, but yeah, that was the that was probably my earliest moment of knowing that I was mm. interested in leadership roles. I do think it comes directly from my dad. Right. I think watching my dad. You know, my dad cared. I mean, my dad was such a salt of the earth guy. He really did care about his employees. He, you know, he, 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 he is what I think people should be when they're in a leadership role. He took the, he took the sacredness of that leadership to heart. Right. Right. And I think, you know, I, I'm not, I, I always go back and forth in my head on if things have gotten better or worse over time. Um, I tend to think, you know, the age old thing that history repeats itself that, there's nothing we're seeing today that hasn't been seen throughout all of right. history, right? Um, so there's been good leaders and bad leaders throughout all, all time, um, but certainly what I, what my dad modeled was compassionate, ethical leadership. Mm. Yeah. So, and you, um, I mean, it sounds like what you're describing is you were observing that. So of course, like you were aware of servant leadership, but like you still were. All, maybe at that time coming from that younger... Oh, I was a little prick. Yeah. <laughs> I, was <laughs> I, mean, being, I was being diplomatic about it. Yeah. I say that was sure. No, no, I totally was. Yeah. I was a little arrogant. Yeah. 
upper middle class Orange County brat. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> so what, where did you end up in college? So um, so I went to well, I did my first two years of college at Orange Coast College in in mm-hmm. Costa Mesa. So shout out to the OCC. Yeah, uh, and then I transferred to Boston University and I went to BU and uh, you know and I was just you know I was a kid trying to find my way. Right. So I uh, I wanted to go as far from Orange County as I could possibly go. Yeah. Boston seemed like a great place. And Orange County is kind of like a more conservative leaning part of the country, especially back then. Yeah, I mean, this was you know you're talking pure Reagan country. Yeah, and you know as a kid, I you know that's what I was raised in. So when I was a kid, I was quote unquote. I mean, I was I was in my teens. I wasn't anything, but mm-hmm. I, was, I thought of myself sort of as Reagan Republican. And then by the time I got into college, I rebelled and I was the opposite. Yeah, and then I went to Boston <laughs> and I was president of the College Democrats in Boston. And, yeah. um, and so you know I've. You know, I've kind of waffled. I've I've spent a lot of time in my life thinking about political philosophy, but right. but yeah. So I went to college in Boston. Do you? Uh, and it, I'm wondering, um, what year was that when you were when you were? I was in Boston, ninety two to ninety five. Okay, so Burning Man was happening. Chances of you having heard from it was no. So my first low. my first introduction to Burning Man was twofold. It was two things that happened the same year, and they were both ninety six. Okay, so first, my friend Michael um, was dating this girl, eighty, and. Um, and she had quote unquote ran, she was working for the first internet company I ever heard of called Wilma. Wilma. So if you're an old school internet person, you'll remember Wilma. It had, it was like an internet music archive of something sort. Yeah. It was sort of a SoundCloud long before SoundCloud. I could do exist. remember Wilma. So she worked for Wilma in like 95, 96 and she was like the most cutting edge avant-garde yeah. person and she quit Wilma and ran off at the circus. And the next time I literally, bumped, literally, okay. and the next time I bumped into her, she had just come come from Burning Man ninety uh, six, and huh. it was this: you've got to go to this thing. That was the same year that Burning Man was on the cover of Wired magazine, yeah, okay, which was yes. a li- which was a life changing thing for many burners, not yeah. just me. And so it was this one two punch of me knowing someone who went to the event and just the sparkle in their eye of you got to go to this thing, mm. and then reading about it in Wired, I was like, I'm going to this thing, and I was at that point um, going pretty religiously to moon tribe and so okay. moon tribe was really small still back then i mean it's still pretty underground but right. but i was religiously going to moon tribe um starting in late 95 and so so a lot of my community at moon tribe were all starting to become burners and uh it did take me f- you know four years to finally get out there um but that was how i got introduced and then they were on the cover of time i guess in 1999 and i right. remember reading they were calling him, I think, M two in the in the Time article about Danger Ranger, and I just remember Danger Ranger talking about temporary autonomous zones, and me being like, "I gotta get in on this! Like, I gotta <laughs> go to this thing." What was going on in your life and career at that time in the in the nineties? So, um, so by the time I got to the playa, I was actually working for the company I now own. Okay. So, um, how I, does that work? <laughs> <laughs> I'm full. Of, I'm full of them for you today, Rosh. <laughs> so, uh, so I had worked. I had gotten. So, I, like I said, going back to leadership, I had done a bunch of student leadership stuff in high school. You know, totally separate from desire to be president. I had done a bunch right. of student leadership stuff. I had, it was this, this organization that still exists, great organization called CASC, the California Association of Student Councils, and it's it's peer it's students teaching students, it's peers, mm-hmm. and I had gotten to go all over the country for that matter from hawaii to florida but mostly in california teaching working with other students and teaching other students things like setting a vision public speaking conflict resolution smart goal setting you know facilitation really skills that skills that were life-changing for me Mm -hmm. and i remember i look back on that time especially when i first got out of college is this really like glorious time and then i had gone to work on capitol hill while I was in college. So I, I interned on Capitol Hill in 1994 okay. um, for a congressman from Chicago. And it was during that time that I realized I had no interest in politics. Yeah. So I worked there for six months and life-changing experience. In fact, watching the insurrection last month was heartbreaking because those places were very special to me. Yeah. Or they are very special to me. What, but, was, what was there? Can you kind of quantify what about it made you realize you didn't want to do it? Sure. So it was a couple things. One is I always, and this is you know, a bit of this was naivety, but what I think what I liked about business leadership was the entrepreneurialism. It, it was uh, entrepreneurialism. It was, um, you know, you had an idea and you sought the idea and you crafted it, and it's its own performance art project in a sense. And politics is different. Politics is not a traditional, you know, looking back on it now, there is a meritocracy to it, but it's far from a traditional meritocracy. It's very bureaucratic. It's a lot about connections. It's all the things people sort of know and assume about politics. But I just remember 
I didn't like the people there. Like right. I didn't like I right. couldn't find genuine human connection. I did with some of the interns I was interns with, but I struggled to. It, it's a there's a lot of there's a lot of sharkiness, if Absolutely. you will, in yeah. DC. So I remember uh, about three weeks into working on the hill, I uh, I would go. I lived in Southwest, and uh, I would walk by. I would walk down to the mall, and I would look at the White House almost every night. And I remember sitting down on the mall. And that's one of the things that broke my heart about the insurrection. You can barely get there now to sit there because right? yeah. it's all fortified. Right. But I would go sit there between yeah. the Washington Monument, Congress, and the White House and just look and like soak up the history. And I just remember thinking, I love this, but this isn't for me. And so I had made the decision when I graduated college that I wasn't going to pursue politics. And so I got back to SoCal when I graduated. I went to work for a... a a training company. I didn't know the difference between student leadership and Tony Robbins. Like it was all sort of one big amalgamation to me. I was a kid. So, um, so I went to work for this company in Carlsbad, California and, and, uh, did really like, I, I didn't personally do so great with my career, but it was a great place to start. And the yeah. company itself did really well. And I was instrumental in helping them do well. Right. And, uh, and I lived near the founders of the company I now run here in San Diego. And, um, they were this fledgling little tech company, kind of pirate-like as well, mm. and um, th- and I was friends with the founders, and I had I would we would uh, on weekends have a barbecue and a beer and share share war stories about what we were up to. Yeah, and then um, and so this I- is this is sort of like the early days of like the Silicon Valley kind of boom stuff. Yeah, well, okay. it was like the mid days of that. Okay, yeah, yeah. And so uh, summer of 1999, um, I got a phone call from one of those guys saying, "Hey, we just got our first round of venture financing. We'd like to hire you." Wow. And so they hired me as their head of sales or their director of sales. And uh, and my job was to be a road warrior. And I was just young and excited and anxious and driven. Yeah. So for like the next three years, I was just, I was living on the road. 15 days a month, 20 days a month. I was traveling to city to city, working with other tech companies, trying to sell our product. Wow. And, um, and then. Did you have a team uh, under you at that time? What's that? Did you have a team under you? Not at first, but eventually. Yeah. Eventually, we went for, it went from just me and, the, and one of the founders doing sales to, I want to say we had 10 or 12 by the okay. time that whole run ended. Let me ask something. Uh, I mean, Orange County grew up, I mean, kind of Republican stronghold, uh, switched Democrat. Where, where, where are you on capitalism, like in, that, in this era? You're an entrepreneur, you're working for a startup. So that's a nuanced question, but I'm happy to dive into that. So sure. I I would say I'm unabashedly a fan of capitalism. Yeah. Now, I believe all games have to have a rule book, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. when I was a kid, we used to, we'd play Monopoly like every kid, and then mm-hmm. my stupid friends and I in high school started playing this game called Thief Monop- Thieving Thief Monopoly, where you were allowed to do whatever you could get away with. <laughs> and okay. so, and uh, let me just let me cut to the chase on this. Yeah. Thief Monopoly is the most boring, stupid game you've ever played because you just wait till someone goes to the bathroom and you steal all the money. Oh <laughs> yeah, like, never mind. It's That's literally terrible. dumb, right? You and know, so, I learned recently, by the way, that most of us, the rules that we think we're supposed to follow, oh in sure, yeah, are we totally don't, wrong. No, yeah, no one knows the actual rules to Monopoly, yeah. but that's a slightly different story. Yeah, <laughs> but from a capitalist perspective, I believe ultimately that the free market is—it's not perfect. But it is as opposed to a command and control architecture. And, mm-hmm. and the thing is, is I think a lot of people look at this as a binary, le- like not left, right, but black or white choice. right? Sure. So, so if your choices are command and control, where you got to go to the top of a bureaucracy to make a single decision, right. or free market, I think the free market is without question uh, yeah. undeniably far superior. Yeah. And I think any rational person would, for the most part, say that. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same point, that's not how the world works. You know, people, you know, lots of the, I wouldn't really call the current GOP conservative because I don't know what they are. Yeah. They're they're this weird autocratic cult. But, yeah. um, you know, people will talk about Northern European socialism. And sure, it's, it, it's certainly got a lot more safety net than America. And I think that's a detailed conversation to have. Right. Um, but you could still start a company in Northern Europe, right? In, in, in most of Europe, right? In most of the world. Mm-hmm. You know where you can't? I mean, you can start a company in China, but if you're Jack Ma, as you could recently learn, they can also just take your company from you. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I would be, I am personally opposed to autocratic systems, right? So I wouldn't want a system where, uh, as long as I hadn't broken a law, the government shouldn't be able to come take my company, right? right? right. Um, so, so I'm, a f- and I think Burning Man's ethos follows that. Burning Man's a duocracy fundamentally, right? And I know it's not officially one of the 10 principles, but, yeah. you know, you want something done at Burning Man, you do it. 
right? And and I think that's that's the part of capitalism that I love. Right, right. I mean, radical self. It's radical reliance, self reliance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It all it all stems from that, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, wh- I think that goes back to my own Burning Man journey early on. One of the things I love about Burning Man is the whole idea of like you know you think about society, you think about a consumption society, and it's funny as a capitalist, I'm I'm not a huge fan of consumerism. Mm-hmm. So, so, and I, that can be its own contradictory thing. But can like, you elaborate just a little bit on how you see a difference between those? Sure. So, consumerism is almost like a drug, mm-hmm. right? This, this, it's a dopamine response cycle. Right. Not, not all that different than what we might do on Instagram or Facebook or these days TikTok, or with a drug, an actual drug. Mm-hmm. But you know, consumerism is this idea that uh, if you're a fan of Mad Men. You're buying happiness. You you buy this idea that if I go get that thing I'm being sold, I will suddenly find a brief happiness. And it actually is, you know, there's there's a there is some biochemistry to it. You buy the thing, you get the dopamine hit, you convince yourself you're happy briefly, and then you go buy the next thing. And yeah, I, that's yeah. what I define sort of as consumerism. And I yeah. think I think we as society, I think if we're going to survive as a species on this planet, I think the planet, by the way, is going to be fine. It's yeah. humans that are in question. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but but if we are going to survive as a species on this planet, I I think, like all addictions, you have to get that under control. And right. I was just reading something Terrence McKenna said recently, how humans addict to everything, and I I that's uh, my own experience in life is that's true. We addict to everything, whether it's love, right. friendship, food, drugs, sex, consumerism. We addict to everything, and I don't know that. You can. I don't know that humans and addiction can be fully separated, but I do think mindfulness can step in, and yeah. and you can you can go from letting those compulsions control you to you having a conversation with those compulsions and making. I don't know if rational is the right term, but making a more nuanced, Absolutely. aware choice. <laughs> yeah, no, because everything you're describing, uh, what where my mind keeps going back to is sort of I guess like the lesson I've learned finally, <laughs> that uh, nothing is stagnant. Every system is constantly moving. Every individual is constantly evolving. And so systems are moving through like various stages of like where they are more beneficial to us versus when they start to take over and they go into toxic places. But nothing is sitting there stagnant. And Absolutely. so we're, we're always moving towards addiction if we're not being mindful or we're moving towards stagnation if we're not moving. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely, and you know, and all of us are moving a little bit towards entropy, but that's a different. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, but, but just what you're describing is is because um, I know like I, the reason I ask these questions is because these are common topics that come up with like our circles. Um, Burning Man is a place where you have like you know the the long haired dreadlocked hippie hanging out next to the Wall Elon Street. Musk. Yeah, right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so there is like th- that's it's, I think it's a very interesting distinction to make between consumerism and capitalism because I do feel like. Maybe a lot of times when the long, long, long-haired hippie is, you know, ranting about capitalism, really what they're talking like about. If you're is a really consumerism. solid long-haired hippie, and maybe you were maybe selling some balloons or doses <laughs> in a parking lot somewhere, you're a capitalist too. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, one of the things that it's always been interesting to me when I try to describe Burning Man to someone who hasn't been, right? The I think the most common misconception I experience about the gift economy is people assume gift economy means barter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm like, no. In fact, yeah. I don't think I've ever bartered for anything on the playa. Mm-hmm. In 15 times on the playa over 22 years, I don't think I've ever bartered for a single thing. Yeah. I have asked for lots, whether it's water, ice. Shoot, in 2017 at the final queue, we had to go find someone who had liquid nitrogen so we could make ice cream. Yeah. Because our liquid nitrogen thing had bled out. Right. So I have asked for all sorts of things on the playa, but I've also given all sorts of things on the playa, and they are never intertwined. Mm-hmm. You give because you have it and you can, and you feel like doing it at that moment. Do you think that that could work? out in the default world if everyone signed on to it? I don't think it can replace our full economy. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, there's a misnomer about Burning Man because there's a before Burning Man and an after Burning Man, which usually right. involves more traditional economic inputs and outputs, right? Yeah. Most of us have been to Walmart in Reno probably more than we want to admit, right? Oh, yeah. And so, so I, I don't think... I don't like to have a rose-colored glasses and assume that we could all just go to gifting all the time because there's still a fundamental process of creation, right? Those things that you're gifting have to come from somewhere. Right. And there's usually some exchange. And I do think that in the default world, so to speak, the process of exchange, are, are they're, they're, they're part of the rule book of how we function. With that said, if someone knocked on my door right now, Assuming mm. in this day and age of cocooning where, that I would actually answer my door. <laughs> but if someone knocked on my door right now... Thank and, you for letting me in, by the way. <laughs> ...and needed food or water, I'm mm. not going to barter. Right. I'm, and I'm not going to say, give me five bucks. Right, right, right. I'm, If someone showed up thirsty and haggard and they needed some water, I'm going to give them some water. 
Yeah. Right. It's no different than I would do on the playa. And, um, you know, and so I, I th- and I think you can bring the ethos of the gift economy to the default world without having to totally upend our economic system. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's because it's, it's all constantly evolving. It's moving. It's and we're navigating within these kind of oceans of these various systems. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, for my own, this is kind of a weird tangent, but one of the things no way, I've not le- on this show. <laughs> one of the things I've learned from the gift economy is things like um, I don't want to get, and, and this uh, this is coming. I'm going to sound like a like a, like I'm coming from a place of privilege, which I am. But mm. one of the things that like, if I'm out, if I want to go to dinner, if we're going to go to dinner tonight, right? Now, if it's some big group thing where I don't necessarily intimately know everyone, and there's an agreement ahead of time, hey, we're going out for Bob's birthday, we're all going to split it equally. That's all fine. But like. If if I wanted to see you and have dinner with you, and then we're out at dinner, and like either we split it or I pay or you pay, I don't want to get hung up on that. Like right. I just whether I gift you or you gift me, right, you right. have to be open to giving and open to receiving, because otherwise you going back to stress and uncertainty. You create all the stress in your life. If yeah. you're worried about someone got a steak and you got a salad when you're trying to pay for dinner, that's that's an undue level of stress. With the caveat that if you can't afford to pay that if you're if you're still on Maslow's hierarchy needs in the survival land right and you're risking stability because someone else bought a steak and you got a side salad th- those are different conversations but assuming you're playing from an equal place I don't want to be sitting there trying to keep score I don't want to count how many beers you had <laughs> right right we either split it or we gift it and, and we just love on each other in that sense yeah 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 it, it to me and in, in <laughs> It makes me think a lot about um, some of the exploration that I've been having about like my own relationship with money, um, which is something I've experienced. A lot of artists around me, like we've we've had uh, we've had struggles with what that relationship is, you know. And and uh, it is an energy stream, and I feel like uh, you know connecting it to the weight loss journey, um, it is kind of feel a little bit like you can sit there and count calories all day long. But you end up going crazy and then gaining yeah, all the way back. I was just saying, I don't know about you, but I never got counting calories to work work for shit. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> it, I mean, I, I I did with carbs, and I was able to lose some, and then it always comes back. Yeah, look, I mean, and you know, my weight loss journey is different, but I have lost 170 pounds or so from my mm-hmm. peak weight, and calorie con- calorie counting was never part of the success. Yeah. of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I feel like almost like focusing on that it activates more stress responses. For me, a lot of, look, I mean, going back to the addiction thing, for me, a lot of that, and part of it was ultimately I did have ba- gastric bypass, but I lost half the weight pre getting a surgery. Yeah. So gastric yeah. bypass was like throwing a turbocharger on it. Yeah. But, um, but for me, it was more about unraveling those addictions than it was ever about calories. Absolutely. You know, it was whether it was an eating disorder addiction or a compulsion addiction, it was all about at least almost all of it. Whether it's whether I'm walking across the playa and my whole body per- hurts and I'm miserable and like why the fuck am I in this dust, mm. or if I if I'm compelled to eat Taco Bell till it makes me sick, all of that has I've been able to grow through that and work on it by just stopping, and breathing, and reflecting. Yeah, and, and 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 you know I've had times when I'm on the playa and I'm in pain and it's hot. And I'm dusty and my fingernails are crusty. And yeah. you know what? Sometimes you just lay on the playa and stretch. And two seconds later or 30 seconds later, you feel like a new person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put a little play on it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Playa solves everything except for playa foot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel, like, I feel like over the years of doing this show, like I've heard every kind of thing that you just pl- put playa right before. And it changes the meaning of what it is. <laughs> Take a little playa nap. Or you got a little playa hair. You got a little playa foot. <laughs> What um, I want to go back to uh, to sort of your earliest experiences. You, you, so you start to learn about Burning Man through the the friend's girlfriend that you mm-hmm. were describing. Um, you're on the road in that time period. Um, that you make the decision that you're going to go to your first burn. So did you, so it kind of sa- that were you perhaps like expecting that transformational experience before attending? Was that a part of the story that you had been told? I think subconsciously I was. Mm-hmm. I think what I had seen in the face of others I had known was that they had all had some sort of pseudo-religious or transformational experience. Right. Did I consciously think I was going for that? No. Hmm. I don't think I was. I don't think I was. I was I was all gas, no brakes, yeah. full, full, full forward. I wasn't doing a lot of self-reflection yet. Um, but Where were you in your professional career in the default world at your first burn? I was I was a salesperson on the road. So okay. for a 27-year-old, I was making a decent living. Okay. Um, 
And then when did you start to have employees under you? Oh, uh, well, I had I had staff at that point. Okay. Um, but I wasn't the boss man, if you will. Like right. I, mean, I was their manager. But um, and I had had employees at my previous gig before the playa. So in my first company, the training mm-hmm. company. Um, and then, yeah, this, I'll try to make this one sort of quick. So the story on how I ended up owning or being CEO and one of the significant shareholders of the company is uh, we survived the dot-com crash. Uh, I'm at this point VP of sales, and, um, and, I, and I work with the company, and I help us. I, I'm one of the team of people that helps sell the company. Yeah. So we sell. And the is, is, the, is the product the same, by the way, the it's, entire time? Yeah. It's a it's a sales uh, it's, storefront. It's an e-commerce platform. E-com- so okay. so if, if someone's listening, it mm-hmm. it would be similar to a sh- what a Shopify is. Okay. It's similar to what a Shopify is. It's a slightly different market segment, but that's what it's similar to. Gotcha. And so um, so I help. I I'm on the team of people that help sell the company. The original founder of the company just he wanted out. He was ready to be done. The company wasn't profitable, and we sold it to a company that was competing with Yahoo at the time. And ironically, no one really was thinking about this little company we now know of as Google. And mm-hmm. so they bought us to be a part of a bigger thing that was going to compete with Yahoo. And um, and then oh, Google, wow. Google came out, went public, and sucked all the air out of the room, as they say. So that company's stock went from... That company was public. And that st- company's stock went from $25 a share down to about 25 cents. Wow. So it did like a reverse GameStop. <laughs> for for top for very topical references and uh, and so uh, and in that time I stayed on with them for about two years and then I quit because I didn't I just I wasn't I, I wasn't thinking, and that was actually I quit right before I ran Playa Q two thousand five mm. that was what gave me the time to take off to run the Playa Q and um, and then about a little over a year after that uh, I got word because I I've always been good at just staying in touch with people I got word from the people we sold it to that they wanted to sell it. Hmm. And um, sometimes, sometimes history goes to the bold. So yeah. they, they asked me, do you know anyone who'd want to buy it? And I, I was piss poor. I had nothing. <laughs> I was behind on my mortgage. I had nothing. Okay. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I do. And, and they were like, and like, you could almost hear it in their voice. Yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> what, why did they want to sell it? Because the, because well, because what had happened was that company had gotten clobbered by Google. Right, 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 right. And so we were just a little small piece of a bigger thing. Okay. And they were trying to sell all the parts they bought. Gotcha. Okay. So they bought like six companies and they turned around and sold all six companies they bought. Okay. So they were going to sell, sell my company. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, I'll buy it. And you could, <laughs> you could hear the, okay, guy in the room. <laughs> um, but I put together a team of four other people. Yeah. Uh, that included the money, and we bought it back from them. And wow! That is how I became CEO of the company. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> Very that cool. That was that was 2007. So that was four, going on 14 years ago. Wow! How big was the company then? How many? Five employees, not counting the four of us who bought it. So it was five employees. So it became nine of you. Yep. <laughs> okay. And today it's like 130. Wow. Um, yeah, it's about. 35 you know on on almost every metric yeah. it's about 30 to 35 times bigger than it was back then so it, it sounds like running playa q was what inspired like like gave you the the juice to some extent i it certainly gave me a lot of life lessons i mean i think it also yeah. goes back to what we're talking about with my dad you know i yeah. think i think i've had lots of i've had a lot i've been blessed to have a lot of mentors whether that mentor was my dad hmm. whether it was the man himself on the playa you know, even an inanimate object that you burn once a year can can teach you a lot. Yeah. Uh, my business partner who helped me buy the company back has been a fabulous mentor and life changer for me. So, you know, it's one of those things. As far as leadership goes, if you think you know it all, uh, th- very rarely will I be this black and white. But if you think you know it all, you're wrong. Yeah. Right. So like you. <laughs> so mentorship is important, whatever that mentorship is. And Burning Man's a great mentor. Yeah. Yeah. The man, the man. If you get a little, you get a little over your skis on the playa. The man will teach you a lesson. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow, that's beautiful. So, uh, we're, so the question is, I guess, like, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of get a better idea of like your driving force behind this. Is it was it the idea of building something that was of interest to you? Was it entrepreneurship? Did did e-commerce? Uh, was that something you were passionate about before you discovered the company? No, it wasn't. I mean, I've always been technically oriented. Right. So e-commerce itself was interesting, I guess. Yeah. Um, it could have been. But if your neighbors were like in a different it, business, it could have been it, a whole different. I was certainly looking for something in the high technology space. Right. Right. So, so I wanted it on that Silicon Valley stuff. What if it was a video site? 
<laughs> yeah, you know? you know, totally. Like, had my neighbors found it in an early video site, I could yeah. have easily been down that path. Right. Um, it could have been anything, anything tech related. Why is tech interesting? Um, I've always been that guy. So okay. at a very young age, you know, back, it's, it's so stupid to say this now, but you know, in when I was a kid, not everyone had computers, right? Yeah. And so, and I'm only 48. I'm not, you know, I'm not a hundred, but. Um, but at 48, when I was a kid, not most, most people did not have computers. I was one of two or three kids in my elementary school who had a computer, you know, I got an early Apple two plus and, and so tech, I was always just technically oriented. I ran a bulletin board when I was really young, you know, everyone else was doing dungeons and dragons. I was running a bulletin board on my dial up and then I 13 and you know, puberty, a hit. bulletin board for the kids who are not familiar with it. <laughs> it was the internet before the internet. Yeah. It, I mean, it's the uh, best way I can describe it, I guess would be like, imagine the one post and all the comments that go under it on Facebook that on its own. Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was sort of like Reddit on yeah. a single person's computer. Right. You would call in and like read right. posts and, and respond to stuff. <laughs> so I ran a bulletin board and then I turned 13 and puberty hit and I stopped touching that computer for like mm. five years. Yeah. Um, but I was always technically oriented mm. and I wanted to I, I, I knew that I wanted to go into tech. Um, but I didn't you know, it's funny. I have always had a strong passion for entrepreneurship. I've always had a strong passion for leadership for sort of crafting something. Right. But, and I had, the, and I, ironically, I am kind of a product guy. I do care a lot about what the product is, but like if if I retired tomorrow and then in a couple of years wanted to start a new company, I don't have some like, I'm not sitting around like, I'm not an inventor. I'm not sitting around being like, oh, I want to invent this next widget. I would likely look for a product I really liked mm. that needed some leadership and some mentorship and try to dive in there. Right. Because to me, it is the community building the, and the leadership in the community building where where all the juice is. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was just about to say. Like, that's what it sounds like. It's like it's what, what really drives you more than anything is still the human to human connection, even though it's through technology. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because even the product that you're working in, it's, I don't know, I could be wrong, but it, it kind of sounds to me like if it was tech and it had nothing to do with connecting people to people, it wouldn't be of it wouldn't be as interesting to you. Yeah. And that's almost certain. I mean, one of the things I wasn't, I didn't wake up thinking I want to go invent e-commerce. Right. right? But, um, but certainly one of the things that I was able to find passion about is our tool and not just our tools, Shopify, Magento, all these tools were fundamentally enabling people to go craft a business. Right. Right. And so it's, you know, we're providing, you know, we have, I've met thousands and thousands of people in my career who got to build their own business and make a living and succeed in one part because we helped provide them a tool. And that is always something that was empowering to me. Yeah. Yeah. The, I want to go back to the, this topic where kind of hinted at a little bit earlier. Have you always been good at handling stress or is that something you developed over time? That's a good question. Let me reflect on that for a second. I don't think I've always been good at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think at some level I've yeah. always had to. I mean, I think right. all people have to. Right. Um, I feel like I got burned out on it. And I feel like uh, I had a, I personally had like a, a um, crash from overwork mm -hmm. uh, and fell into like depression for like three months. Like, and it was, it was a very interesting kind of depression. Like I wasn't sadness. I wasn't walking around sad. I just had zero juice. Yeah, it was the malaise. Just, I was done. Yeah. And I couldn't even figure out what it was. And I had like friend, like close friends, uh, close friends with Navjit who produces Alkaline. He just had to look me right in the eye and say like, dude, you burned out. Yep. You, you, just, you need to recover your juices, like take time off. And so since then, I feel like I've always had like a bit of PTSD about pushing too hard again because I'm afraid of stress and fear. Yeah, I think this though. I mean, I think, that's a very binary way to look at it. Mm. And I think that like, I can think back in the last 12 months, we've all had a wild 12 months, right? It's yeah, cliche, yeah. but at this point, but, but the last 12 months are wild. And there were certainly things that happened during pandemic stress wise that I didn't handle well. But then there was a part of me that was able to like, like sort of awake from that and then be like, well, I do know historically that if I eat better and mm. drink less and work out, and, you know, and pay attention to my human connections that, right. that I can get out, I can get from, I can get from my current dip to a better place. So I think I have, I think I have, I think maybe a little bit because I grew up in an entrepreneurial household, 
that there was a there was a sort of a natural ebbs and flows, and so I saw that a lot. Um, but certainly, I've had I, I've I have certain habits that are good responders to stress, and I've certainly had bad habits in response right. to stress. Well, it's because I mean it's, it's such a timely topic, I guess. Like you're right, the past year, of course, being such a microcosm of stress study <laughs> on virtually everybody we know. Um, yeah. You know, and part of like where my thought goes is we have so many people who are experiencing stress and anxiety sort of like in their little microcosms. And then I'm looking at where you're at, where you're navigating how to keep a company going and keeping 130 people employed. Yeah. And I've been on, I not just been on, I routinely end up on both sides of that mental exercise, right? Mm. There's days that you wake up and that's like an elephant sitting on your chest. Right. But there's also days that I wake up and that's like, that's the thing, man. Like that's the, like, you know, you see one of your employees and they had a kid or they bought a house or mm. they have, they post something joyous on Facebook and you know, you're not responsible for it. They're the, they're the crafters of their life. They're, they're you know, but you, you in some way gave some lift to their wing and yeah. it's, it's just a wonderful thing. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, I had I had a question specifically about that topic, but uh, but your response just kind of made me go blank for a second. Um, do you do you feel that the kinds of stress that you are more motivated to navigate um, change? Like I wonder, like if it's if it's a topic that's not of as much interest to you, is that more stressful versus like what you're describing? seeing that you're able to help facilitate human connections and human lives that gives you juice that gives you energy that's a good question i i don't know let me think about that for a second you know i i don't know i mean there's like like anyone there's certainly topics i'm avoidant of mm. right? like <laughs> i don't run headlong into everything yeah, yeah right but um but i don't know that there's any I like solving problems. I mean, if I if I try to get into some of the more personality par- portions of the profile, mm. I like solving problems, right? So if if I can solve a problem, that's great. If it's digging a ditch, you know, if my, if, if the stressful experience in front of me mm. is I have to dig a ditch, I might drag my heels on digging that ditch. I mean, I'll ultimately do it if I got to do it. But yeah. you know, so, so so yeah, I I like solving problems. I do like collaboration. You know, are you able to key in on what kinds of problems are most interesting to you to solve? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Oftentimes I am. Yeah. Um, you know, go, kind of going back to what you were saying about the PTSD, and the burnout. I think I think for anyone, you know, there's the there's the old the old parable of the tortoise and the hare, right? And mm. the there's also like going back to some of the bad parts of capitalism. We've been we've been very much so trained in this country that your self worth comes from your capitalist identity, right? So right. it's the first question we all intuitively ask: What do you do? What do you do? Yeah. Right? And so, um, and I'm even super conscious of that being the first question. And God help me, it's hard not to ask that question because I don't know what else to ask sometimes. Right, right, right. Right? What are you passionate about? What excites you? Great, but it's so hard not to just start with: Tell me about yourself. What do you do? And um, and when I transitioned from building. When we first bought the business back, sure I was in charge, but there was there wasn't enough hands on deck to not. I was still you know I was still digging a ditch so to speak, right? I mean I, there wasn't enough people around. We weren't big enough to. Everyone had to pick up a shovel and dig. Yeah. And as we got bigger and more successful, and I started having senior management team who reported directly to me, who really over the last five years of my life have gone from where where I used to make almost every decision in the company to. These days, I do my podcast and my books, and I and I I do stuff, but and I do a lot of stuff. I'm not trying to dismiss my, sure. my role, but but I I have built a team that can make day to day decisions without without having to rely on me, right? Mm. And when I first accomplished that, I went through my own sort of questioning myself, right? Like, well, what do, what is it I do for a living? And I went to my own versions of depression, right? Like, I didn't feel like I had a job anymore. Huh. I and, and um, and I think the thing that's always helped me come out of that, regardless of the stress, is is this the state I want to you know asking yourself your own questions. This is is this the state I want to be in, and and if it's not, what state do I want to be in? Right. And how how do I you know maybe what are some ideas on how to get to that state? Right. So I had to learn to accept that my worth is not 
in, you know, answering X number of emails in a day. Right. Right. My worth comes from from the leadership I'm providing or from the vision I'm providing. Right. Um, and I think that's true for all of us in many ways, right? I mean, you put a bunch of effort into producing this podcast, mm-hmm. but I would argue that the value that this podcast bring is the thought and the leadership that it took for you to start it. I know what a pain in the ass is this sort of <laughs> podcast. Yeah. I mean, I'm only 30 or 40 episodes in, yeah. but it's a pain. And then you got to think about topics and you got to book guests and you yeah. got to do all this stuff. And, and that's all the ditch digging. But the real value, the real the real art you're bringing to the table was you had this vision to do it. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then you had the fortitude to go execute on the vision. Yeah. And yeah, a big chunk of it was that nobody else is doing it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Literally went to By the way, I podcast. saw you get a shout out in the JRS a couple weeks ago. Congrats oh, yeah. on that. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, I, I have not seen that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I got to yeah, look that up. Jer- I've- Unless I'm unless I'm totally hallucinating, you're in the JRS. I want to say one or two episodes ago. Oh, entirely possible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> cool. Um, my my my. This was I was going to ask you this question. Um, I have the luxury, like as an artist, I have the luxury to when I zero in on not being in the state that I want to be, I'll walk away and not make difficult decisions until I'm in a better state. Yep. Um, I feel like in the position that you're in, you may not have that luxury 100% of the time. And I wonder what that experience is like for you. Yeah, that's true. I, I wouldn't have thought about it in those terms, but that's absolutely true. You know, there are times that you're making a real time. Like if our servers go down. Right. I don't get the luxury of waiting until yeah. I feel like fi- yeah. helping work on it. It's two in the morning. Wake the fuck up. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. And so, so, um, so that's true. I, I think the way I cope with that is you do what you got to do in the moment, and you make the best decisions you can make in the moment. Don't beat yourself up over them. That's just yeah. the best you can do. No one looks back on their life and is proud of every decision they've made. It, that's that's a ridiculous, yeah. a ridiculous standard by which you will just beat yourself up, and that's its own problem. So you make the best decisions you can. I it's two things for me. I try to have a list of heuristics or rules to live by. Right, so I have sort of gut. If you have to stop and analyze it every single time, yeah. those are the dogs. Hi, dogs. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you have to stop and analyze it every single time and work from scratch, and you don't have a philosophical bench to lead from, it's hard to make great decisions that way. So yeah. I, I spend time reflecting and reading books on leadership and and talking to mentors and and just have some intuitive guideposts that you that you become second nature to you for decision making. Yeah. Then you just make the decisions. Right, you, and you can't spend too much time being paralyzed on them, but and this is the other critical part of it: you have to have the philosophical heuristics, then you make the decisions, and then you. The third part of that whole story is you have to take the time after you've made the decisions to reflect on them. And if mm. you if you look back and you're like, "Wow, I really nailed that," great. Right. Reinforce the heuristic that you used to nail it. If you look back on that and you're like, <laughs> if you look back, someone oh, just rang my doorbell, so the dogs are going the nuts. The symphony of dogs go by. Yeah. It was um, a dramatic moment too. <laughs> but if you look back on, if you look back on it, so if you look back on it and you're happy with your decision making, mm-hmm. then you want to reinforce those heuristics. You want right. to say, "Wow, that you know that 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 logic that I used to make the decision, or that emotion I used was right on." Or if you would have made it differently, don't beat yourself up, but just course correct. Next time something right. like this comes across my desk, think about it differently. Yeah. How do you? I feel like a, it's an observation that I've had in myself and many people um, where we get too fixated on how do we course correct because I feel like the, it almost feels like that's where you get into almost like religious thinking. Yeah. How do I set more rules so that I don't fuck up again in the future? Well, and that, that is, that you are correct and that is an absolute recipe for utter disaster. I yeah. mean, that's where you go from heuristics to dogma. Yeah. Right? And... <laughs> Doggies! Um... <laughs> That's where you go from heuristics to dogma, but and dogma is dangerous. Mm. I mean, I, I I will say that in in almost dogmatic terms, but dogma right. is dangerous. <laughs> and so, um, you know, if i going back to the political thing, I grew up in Orange County, mm. right during the Reagan years. It would have been easy for me to turn that into a dogma. I certainly went to people with high school who've turned that into a dogma. Right. And you know now, thirty. Thirty-six to forty years later, or thirty years later from yeah, thirty years later from when I graduated high school, some of those people would have been willing to see our government overthrown for that right. for that guy we just got out of office, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's what dogma does, um, yeah. as opposed to being reflective on what you believe and why do you believe it. Like, 
and it's okay to change beliefs. You know, it's uh, it's okay to be different. You know, Aziz got him, Aziz Ansari, the comedian. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know Aziz, but Aziz got himself in trouble with the Me Too movement. Yeah. It was a time, I think, of a lot, or it's still a time, but it was a time of a lot of self-reflection. And he took some time off, and he came back, and he did his new Netflix special with Spike Jones, and he and and he talks in that special. But yeah, it, I've evolved. I'm different today. And he says, you know what? That's how it's supposed to work. Right. Like, I'm yeah. not supposed to act the same way I act 20 years ago. Yeah. Or even five years ago. And and I think that's critical for all of us. I think I think it's have have beliefs make decisions, reflect on those beliefs, and how would you do it differently next time? And yeah. if you can constantly do that in your life, you can really you can really refine your life in a positive way. Right. Celebrating impermanence, like the man. Totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the man's a giant mandala, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what would you say is the... Like, could you pinpoint the biggest leadership lesson that you learned from your time burning uh, as something that you did, like, directly... Um, put into place in your default world sure yeah business. that that one's that, that one almost feels like a softball but um <laughs> but i think it goes back to you talking about your first burn experience and mm. and you freaking out about the idea of what if someone doesn't show up right right someone someone's volunteered to spin some fire and oh my god they're not here <laughs> <laughs> right um yeah. And, and I think the the most core principle and, and this is literally an operating principle my senior management team in my company uses we can figure it out yeah and, and if you come from a place that we can figure it out, uh, it, there's times you're going to get your ass kicked. But if you can come from a place that we can figure it out, you will figure it out most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I am in a relationship now, and that's literally like that's part of our mantra <laughs> every day. Like absolutely, no and matter I, what it is, I am it's too. It out. I am too, and I would yeah. say that's that's a key part. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's what relationships are all about. You, right. you work through. You commit to growing with someone, yeah. and you know, are you going to do things that annoy each other? Yeah. yeah. And a little secret to anyone listening: you're just as annoying as you think your partner is, yeah, <laughs> if yeah, not more yeah. so. Yeah. And the chances of either of you being the same people, uh, you know, five years from now, ten years from now, hell, two weeks from now, <laughs> that yeah, seriously. today, yeah, yeah, the last, the yeah, last eleven months lunacy. is really warped time, <laughs> <laughs> lunacy. Um, so in in the meantime, uh, you have written a book, which was like the kickoff to the podcast. Is, yeah, am I understand it correctly. Yep. Can you talk about the book a little bit? Sure. So the book started out as this idea that um, it, it's kind of a we can figure it out book too, but it's it's called Dragon Proof E Commerce, mm. and um, the idea is that uh, if you want to go start a business, it's really an entrep- it's an inspiration book in theory for entrepreneurs. If you want to go start a business, um. And this was sort of tactical. Hey, Amazon's out there. Amazon's the quote unquote dragon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We titled it at the height of Game of Thrones, right? So, I love it. so that's where the dragon <laughs> stuff comes from. Um, but uh, so this idea that Amazon's the dragon, but if you're so afraid of the dragon, you keep postponing starting the business, you'll never start your business. Because before Amazon, there was Walmart. Before Walmart, there was Sears. Right. Right. There is always a dragon. In fact, the pandemic proved there's bigger dragons than Amazon. The pandemic's been the biggest dragon any of us have ever seen in our lifetimes, right? right? And so, and the the gist of the book is is fairly simple, um, is that there's always dragons. So assess the dragon, understand the strengths and weaknesses of the dragon, figure out what you want to do and how you can cohabitate with said dragon. And then the yeah. podcast is an extension of that. The podcast is taking that philosophy, started out as me interviewing merchants, me interviewing people selling online, mm. Um, and asking them about it, you know, people that as, are using your platform. Not always. I mean, uh-huh. it could have been someone else. It could, you know, they uh-huh. could use any platform. I didn't have a horse in that race, so to speak. This, it's not a self promotion project for the platform. It's right. really, it's really a business thought leadership project. Um, yeah, dragons so eat horses. I just want to put that out. <laughs> uh, and so it's really, it started out as this idea of interviewing merchants, and I wanted to ask people how about their success journey. Right. Um, as I'm sure you probably had your own learnings in the podcast process. I did a few of those and they all started sounding the exact same. <laughs> so I started wanting to evolve the podcast. Yeah. So some, so it ranges. I still do that. In fact, uh, I recorded one two days ago, which was actually on the topic of Jeff Bezos's retirement. Mm. And then I'll record one in a week and a half. That's with a, a customer of ours. Who's who I just want to find out how, you know, how their business is going. Um, but we just, I, I kind of do topical. I'll do stuff that's in the news. I'll do leadership concepts. All right. And then I'll do an interview, and I sort of mix and match those. And I'm trying to do 25, 26 a year, and then we're working on a new book this year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, 
I mean, you're you, you've you've been analyzing the crap, obviously, out of like everything that's happening with our economy, with COVID. Uh, do you have some predictions of like what what we'll be looking at in the next couple of years, as far as uh, people looking to invest in business, um, but also just even Burning Man? Like, what are some thoughts that are coming to you that? that are interesting things to watch out for in the next couple of years. Sure, so a few things. One is, uh, and this is sort of a, uh, I'm stealing this one from Warren Buffett, but, um, and this goes back to my to my support of, my, my basics and, and consistent support of capitalism in theory, which is American capitalism is, is the greatest economic force in human history. Uh, it's not perfect. It's certainly u- used improperly. It's like any tool or weapon that's used improperly, but, right. but it's the greatest economic force in human history. And, and that's not going to change. Now we need to address things like climate and, and there's all sorts of things we have to address. And yeah, we, we always run real close to the rail as a society, but, but it's as good a time as any to start a business. But going back to being dragon proof, you know, if you were in the service industry before this, you're probably reflecting on the fact that, you know, how could I have evolved to keep serving people when I can't actually see them in person, right. for example, during a right. pandemic. So you take those life lessons, you reflect on it. But I, I think if anyone has the itch to start a business, they should. Now, that doesn't mean you just go take all your money and throw it away. But but you should find a mentor, find something you're passionate about. If you, if you want to learn, go work for someone else. But keep in mind that you're working for someone else to learn so you can do it yourself. Right. Um, as far as Burning Man goes, you know, I think... I know everyone's everyone's sort of at max pandemic fatigue right now. Yeah. Uh, even you and I, I mean, normally we would have been sitting, we're socially distanced for sure. those listening. We're in my backyard, so we're outdoors. Yeah. We're probably 15 feet apart. And, the privilege uh, of living in San Diego, by the yep, way. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. And, uh, and we took some great precautions to be able to do this safely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the next three to six months we need to keep the way. But I do think that we're coming to an end, right? Mm-hmm. That that the world will whatever the new normal is going to be is going to start showing up for us here by the end of summer. Okay, and I think that that is going to unleash a lot of creativity. You know, think about how fucked up the world was during the Vietnam War and all the great art that came out of it. And it really sucks that we had to get in a shitty war in Asia to have great right. art. But but to, but springs springs of art springs of creativity springs of business tend to follow really hard times. And so I think. I think there's a lot of momentum for some really great things coming in the next two years. Mm. And, you know, I actually haven't read the Thunderdome thing. I'll have to go find it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I filled out the survey and, you know, I'm certainly willing to, and I, again, going from a place of privilege, I'm certainly willing to buy some tickets to Burning Man this year that I'm willing to donate just to keep them alive. Right. But I also know that I have, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have that situation. But I am, I have a feeling the next full burn, whenever they can get that engine restarted, is going to be, it's going to be one for the record books, right? Do you have, do you have thoughts on how long it would be before we would be able to have the kind of burn we had in I don't know 2018? I 19? think next year. I think okay. so. So you think another so year? So here's the thing: there was, from what I understand, I wasn't there, mm. but I think there was about 2,000 people on Playa this past year, right? Right, and mostly staff and friends of staff, mm. right? And they certainly did a decent job of keeping it under wraps. I mean, people all knew you were going to yeah, go out yeah, there, yeah. but. Uh, I, they're, you know, they have an, the Marion and the org have a, have a challenge ahead of them, right? How do you keep a genie in a bottle? Right. There's going to be they more. They can't stop people from going. You're right. There's going yeah. to be more people this year than last year. Right. People will be some some percentage will be vaccinated. Some percentage of people will have had it and think that they're immune. Right. right? There will be more people this year than last year. So what is the best course of action for Burning Man to to ride that wave? Because Burning Man, like everything, has to ride the wave that presents itself. I think next year. 2022 burning man can be back to something that feels like the burning man we knew from say 2011 when it started selling out to 2019 right right (laughs) yeah i I gotta tell you it's person this is completely personal thought i kind of it sucked that we didn't have Burning Man for a couple of years, but I kind of like liked having a couple of years off. To yeah, like look, I mean, so I had actually <laughs> taken I had taken eighteen and nineteen off because after the final Q yeah. in seventeen, uh, you know, to use an old wrestling analogy, I felt like I'd left it on the mat. Right? Yeah, so I didn't yeah. have yeah. I just didn't have it to give in eighteen and nineteen. Yeah, and uh, and then I had bought tickets for twenty, and then of course pandemic hit. Yeah, so so I'm certainly my my itch uh, my itch to go on the playa is I, I say it to my girlfriend yeah. kind of. Every, 
probably once a week. I really want to go to the ply. <laughs> oh my god, no, I'm I'm fully there. Don't get me wrong. Like yeah. I every day I wake up and I have that feeling. But at the same time, I'm like, man, like this is the way that I've always explained it is that when the pandemic hit, um, it's like. I'd been walking with my shoelaces, like one of my shoelaces untied, and I'd been desperately needing to like stop, stop. and tie this yeah, fucking yeah. thing, but I kept not wanting to. Finally, I gave up and I did it, and I looked up, and the whole world was waiting for me. Yeah, that's what it's like felt like. So even with Bernie Man taking a couple of years off, it's like, God damn it, I miss being out there. Like you know, but yeah. but at the same time, like maybe it's probably good that and because FOMO is a motherfucker. FOMO is a motherfucker, <laughs> and I think as long no, it's true, and I think mm. as long as Burning Man the organization mm. can survive. The budgetary crisis that the pandemic created. Right. I think it will come back stronger and more resilient than we've ever yeah. seen. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. And, and I just must say, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, thank you so much for all of your, your wisdom and all the time that you've put into building community uh, in and out of the default world. Uh, really appreciate all of it. I've spent so much time, you know, at Spankies and like I know so many people who like build connection and communities through the work you've done on Playa. So uh, thank you. Thank you for all of that. Um, and just for the listeners, I always want to say, um, you know, I, I've really appreciated your voice in this time of the pandemic because you do have, you are breaking down actual information, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> but you're also like looking at it from the perspective of, uh, a kind of a calmer energy like you're navigating the stress well uh i appreciate your input it's not doom and gloom but it's also realistic sure yeah, yeah, honest yeah, yeah. you can't authentic. ignore it yeah um it's it is the it is the kind of voice that i appreciate hearing from the leadership in my community so uh i, I highly recommend uh listeners check out your podcast and and the book i'm planning on actually snagging a copy i'll so just give you a copy it. on the way yeah. out yeah yeah can you sign it for me yeah of course <laughs> so you know I, I i first of all thank you yeah. i appreciate the kind words i appreciate you giving me the opportunity to be on here i wasn't sure what to expect yeah. most of the podcasts in fact all the podcasts i've ever been on have been business related so this has been interesting but you know and i don't know the exact quote um but i know timothy leary toward the end of his life mm. um talked about the sport that's the sport that's closest to the meaning of enlightenment is surfing surfing yep and he talks about it's wow. about riding the wave. Yeah, yes. And I think it's all about riding the wave. Absolutely. That's been the... <laughs> that's I've been writing about specifically that quite a bit. That is what's like the stress that comes up is the wave. To absolutely. And so Burning like, Man's budget this? crisis is the wave. Yeah. Whether we can safely go this year is the wave. Yeah. How, so that's, that's where you can't, you know, you have to be sober and honest in your reflection. But why be doom and gloom? The waves come. Ride right, waves. right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, one of the examples that I always give to is uh, tragedy is simply, uh, I'm sorry, comedy is simply tragedy plus time. Oh, absolutely. The more you can yeah, minimize yeah. the time part. Yeah, <laughs> look, I don't, we, don't, we don't want to start another podcast here, but yeah. if you've ever known very many comedians, there's yeah. some dark people. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Maybe we'll do a part two. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, yeah. Arash. Thanks no, for having me. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, I'm going to do the outro thing here. You, you're you're hearing music right now there's definitely music playing i don't know what it is <laughs> i don't know what dj said it is um i might even have to like cut in and do a little like editor's edit right now to say who it is right here and i'm back i don't know or there might not be we just might play the music i don't know um you're listening to the sounds of somebody and it's an amazing set and i'm loving it and uh, all the links are going to be over at burnerpodcast.com along with the show notes uh, along uh with links to rick's podcast and book Dragonproof e-commerce. Those links are all over at burnerpodcast.com where you'll also find links to Alkaline, Build to Burn, Into the Fire, and music.bm. Our producers are Louis Gallopo in Bermuda and Lana Boy in Brooklyn. Our opening theme music is America's Horse with No Name Remix. It is produced by Joman. You can find him over at soundcloud.com slash DJ Joman. Until next time, love, light, and all that other crap. I think we're going to go back to the playa <laughs> with whoever it is that's playing this music. <laughs>
Burnerpodcast.com, 